Due to the immense success and influence of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, director Eugene Lorre was offered a great number of similar science fiction scripts throughout the 50s, most of which he found to be terrible. However, one in which the monster is literally a huge glob of radiation caught his interest. Seeing the potential, he agreed to direct, bringing on 20,000 Fathoms screenwriter Daniel James to do a rewrite, and even getting stop-motion pioneer Willis O'Brien to oversee the special effects. But producers from distributor Allied Artist Pictures insisted that the blob be turned into a physical creature, similar to the Retosaurus from Laurie's previous picture. And so naturally, given these obvious similarities, by the time the film, titled The Giant Behemoth, was released in 1959, it was transformed into a near carbon copy of its inspiration that, while sporting some interesting concepts and ideas, feels pedestrian and outdated. <laughs> When mountains of dead fish wash ashore along the tiny fishing village of Lou, England, radiation scientists Steve Carnes and Professor James Bickford arrive to investigate, where they discover wrecked passenger ships and villagers with strange and sickly radiation burns. Further testing reveals the fish are highly radioactive, which, along with reports of a mysterious behemoth, leads Dr. Carnes to hypothesize that the cause is a large marine animal contaminated by atomic testing. Very quickly, more sightings of the creature begin to mount, until it finally makes its itself known to the world. As the death toll and destruction continues to mount, Dr. Carnes and Bickford must come up with a solution to kill the behemoth before it turns London into a radioactive wasteland. <laughs> The Giant Behemoth feels like a film that should have come out years before it actually did. Despite being released near the end of the decade, you'd think you were watching a film at best a year or two removed from the film that it copies. Whether intentional or not, the film is very, very similar to The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, even more so than many of the copycats that had followed years prior. From the look of the creature, to the structure of the story, to even the ending, it's all nearly identical. This in itself doesn't make the film terrible. Indeed, the script is solid, and the story more consciously explores the danger of atomic power more so than many other Western-made monster movies. But it is extremely derivative, and when you combine this with a slower pace and for the time unimpressive special effects, you have a film that's a very mixed bag. I think it's moving. That's it. I know it. One of the weaker elements of the giant behemoth is, oddly enough, the behemoth itself. It's just too generic, and feels way too similar to the Retosaurus from The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, so much so that a less obsessed viewer could get the two confused. The stop motion used to bring the creature to life is merely okay, which is a surprise given that the great Willis O'Brien was involved, but it suffers from a lack of detail, and never excels beyond anything that wasn't already being done at the time. Even worse is the prop head used for the underwater sequences. It's not convincing at all. It's stiff and has no movements or expressions. All this leads to a monster that's just not very interesting to watch on screen, which in a giant monster movie is a major issue. <laughs> As for the characters, the giant behemoth really focuses on only two, Dr. Steve Carnes and Professor James Bickford, played by Gene Evans and Andre Morrill. The majority of the story follows them as they investigate and begin to put the pieces together, and it's actually pretty engaging and very scientifically detailed. There's even a long scene showing them testing fish for radiation contamination, and even though it could be argued it's filler, it's kind of interesting and helps make the film feel a bit more plausible. Around them is a cast that comes and goes with the plot, including a few likable villagers introduced early on who are quickly forgotten, which is unfortunate because they helped bring the film down to a more relatable level that it never quite matches again when they disappear. There's also a very eccentric paleontologist character that comes in halfway that instantly stands out thanks to an over-the-top performance by Jack McGowan. It's a small but memorable part that brings some levity to a pretty serious-minded film. Well, what can they be? The tall, graceful neck of Paleosaurus. He can stay underneath the surface for an age. Now, now he comes to the top.
The Giant Behemoth is also a much slower movie than you might expect. The monster is hidden for most of the runtime, with brief glimpses here and there used to build tension. And while the end result doesn't quite live up to this tension, it is nonetheless effective in giving the film a building sense of dread and an interesting mystery to solve. The film is also more brutal than you might expect. It doesn't shy away from the body count. People on screen are shown being killed by the Behemoth, including kids and even dogs. It's never graphic, of course, but it does give the film a harder edge than some other films of its kind. Overall, The Giant Behemoth feels like a step back for the genre at the time, a film that should have come out years earlier. Nothing about it is innovative or pushes the art form to new levels. Still, as derivative as it is, the nuclear allegory is potent and appreciated. While the payoff is a letdown, the central mystery is well constructed and paced. If you're into monster movies, it's well worth a look, because it's so familiar you'll feel right at home. Just don't be too surprised if you forget most of it after. For more reviews and opinions on all things kaiju, subscribe and stay tuned to Up From The Depths.